Voices. I'm Therese Madigan, and today we're joined by Vermont's own Secretary of State, Jim Condos. Secretary Condos, thank you so much for joining me today. You're quite welcome, Therese. <laughs> I, I enjoy coming down to Bennington County. Oh, always good to hear. Could you start by telling me a little bit about yourself and your role in our government? Sure. Um, first, I, I, I guess my background starts with when I was growing up in South Burlington, um, and I had my home there and I got involved in politics mainly at the local level uh, and I, I ended up getting elected to uh, the city council in South Burlington in uh, 1989 and I served for 18 years uh, until 2007. The last eight years I was the chair of the council which is kind of the de facto mayor um, and while I was also there I also served in the state senate from 2001 to 2008 um, and well, I was, uh, I got out in 2008, went back into private sector uh, business, and I was uh, on an airplane, and Deb Markowitz had just uh, announced that she was running for governor, and she said, you ought to think about running for Secretary of State, since I'm not running again. And that was in 2008, and I said, well, I'll, I'll think about it. And, and within a year, I decided, okay, I think I'll, tr I'll try it, and, and I won. In 2010 it was uh, the first year that I, I ran, and I won, uh, and I've been serving since 2011. Wow, it's a very multifaceted history. <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> and what does that role entail? Um, so I have five different divisions that I actually oversee. Uh, the first one would be the Office of Professional Regulation. That's my biggest uh, it's 50 professions that we oversee, things like accountants, tattooists, barbers, cosmetologists, nurses, um, engineers, just pretty much professional licensing. And it's, it oversees, so I, like I said, 50 professions and about 60, 65,000 license holders. And we actually administer the licensing program, but we also uh, receive complaints against licensees uh, investigate and can prosecute as well. Um, my second, that's my largest division, that's about 35 out of my 75 employees. Uh, the next largest is the State Archives, and it's a State Archives and Records Management Unit. They're located in Middlesex and in a state-of-the-art facility, and they actually, they handle our state's most precious documents like the Constitution, uh, the signed Bill of Rights that, w that the Vermont Legislature signed and sent back to Congress. Um, th one of the things that people didn't know is after Hurricane Irene hit, when a lot of uh, uh, roads and, and bridges and, and uh, streams changed course, demolished the roads and bridges, yeah. um, we actually, from the archives, we were pulling out some of the old maps and old photos so that uh, the Agency of Transportation and the Agency of Natural Resources could figure out where they had to put the roads back to, where, where to relocate the streams to get them back to where they belonged. Uh, so uh, there, was, there was a lot going on there. That's an important function. There's about 18 employees there. Uh, then I have uh, corporations and business registration, um, which is where if you want to do business in Vermont, you're supposed to be registered with the state of Vermont, and that happens in our office. Uh, we handle both nonprofits and for profits. Uh, we also handle uh, UCC liens, uh, which are like loans that businesses to business make. And when you have a lien on, on a company, you want to have it somewhere that everybody knows it's out there. So banks will file with us. And our website gets used daily, tens of thousands of times, um, uh, as they're looking for information about businesses in the state of Vermont. Uh, the fourth is elections. Elections, obviously, is the one that I'm probably best known for because of, of what we do, and it's so prominent, and it's such a, it's the election is a, really the very basis of our democracy, and uh, it's where it all starts, and we try to maintain the integrity of that. We also train the town clerks on a lot of different functions that they have to do. Uh, we work with the town clerks to make sure that uh, the, they're getting the, the help that they need, the resources that they need as much as we can uh, within state budgets. Um, uh, we also, that in that division, we handle campaign finance and lobbyist disclosure as well, so it's an online system for both. Uh, and then the last thing is we have a municipal division where we actually work, you know, we receive calls from 
whether it be citizens or municipal um, select board members, uh, uh, planning commission members that have questions, they'll call our office. We have someone dedicated just to answering those calls. Wow. And you mentioned that elections are really the foundation of a democracy, and you've spoken pretty extensively on the issue of campaign finance. Yes, reform. I have. <laughs> Could you tell me a little bit about why this is such a vital issue? Well, essentially, when you talk about campaign finance, it's really important that people, that the citizenry, understand where the money's coming from, how it's being spent, and who it's being spent on. Mm -hmm. um, and in the old, when I first took office, our entire office was basically a paper-driven office. Everything was done on paper, no matter what division you were in. Um, we have now, in six years, six plus years, really transformed it to we're now pretty much an online system. Uh, and we have probably 97% of our transactions today are being handled online, whereas in 2011, when I first took office, it was literally 0% being done online. Uh, so we've really increased both our efficiency, our, our productivity, but also our accuracy, uh, and those are all important. But in the area of, of, of uh, campaign finance, the old system was each candidate would fill out their campaign finance form and send it to us, literally send it to us. Uh, we would have to scan it in and then post it on our website. You couldn't do anything with it except read it sometimes. Sometimes it was hard to read because they'd scratch it out because they made a mistake. They'd scratch it out and write underneath it or something like that. Um, so we had a lot of, we, we struggled with that quite a bit. And people could not, if, if I wanted to find out if uh, ExxonMobil had donated money to anybody, I would have to literally go to each form to see if ExxonMobil had, had done it. Now, with our new online system, and it's 100% mandatory that all candidates have to file online, uh, the system has, it's a searchable, downloadable uh, database. Uh, you can punch in ExxonMobil and find out not only how much they've given, but to who they've given. Uh, and it's, it's pretty much done in a couple clicks and you're, and you're, you're there. So we've really brought it to a new level, and, and campaign finance we could probably spend an hour on, but yeah. campaign finance uh, has been has had a really rough time. Um, in 1998, Vermont passed a law uh, that limited contributions, but also limited expenditures. Uh, and shortly after um, that was passed, a lawsuit was filed, and the, the federal court overturned the part that said that we could limit expenditures, saying that you can't limit expenditures. That's untouchable. And Citizens United. And, well, this is no. Citizens United actually didn't happen, I think, till 2009. This is, this is back in well 1999, 19, 2000, somewhere around there. And this had to do with just expenditure side. Mm -hmm. And we had also set very low limits. Uh, prior to 1998, uh, the, limits, the, the expenditure limit was $2,000 per contribution was the maximum. And it didn't matter whether you were running for governor or running for select board. It was $2,000. Um, we set it at that time at $400 for, for a governor's race, $300 for the state senate, uh, uh, 200 for um, uh, local races. And uh, that was challenged. And that, in 2006, was overturned as well. And, and so we, the, the Attorney General essentially resurrected the old law, which was the $2,000 across the board. And we operated from 2006 or 2007 through 2012 with that old law of $2,000. And then in, in 2012, uh, I pushed the legislature to, and worked with the legislature to uh, uh, have them address the whole issue. Um, and we changed it so it was four thousand dollars for a, a, a statewide office. It was two uh, fifteen hundred dollars for a state senator, a thousand dollars for uh, a, a rep, state rep. So we had we made some changes there, and we actually added additional uh, disclosure dates. Um, and, and really, what Citizens United has given us, Citizens United is another piece that occurred in, like I said, two thousand nine. And, and what that did was it, it essentially said that anybody could donate any amount of money to any PAC, super PAC, as long as the super PAC wasn't 
uh, controlling, wasn't collaborating with a candidate. So if you had XYZ pack out here and they wanted to support me, as long as they didn't talk to me and, and work it out how they were going to spend the money, they could spend as much as they wanted, get contributions at whatever limit they wanted. Um, and it was really, it, it really changed the game. And that's why you've seen this proliferation of, of, of uh, uh, expenditures uh, on, on candidates. And, and, and I'll just give you another quick example. If you look at the governor's race last time, so prior to last year, mm, I think it was probably at that, before that it was probably a million to two million dollars was spent to, to run for governor. Mm -hmm. um, and in the mid 2000s, it was probably around half a million to 600,000. Last year for the governor's race, including the, the primary and, the, and the, the general election, $13 million was spent for the governor's race. So you can see the money is just getting out of hand, yeah. and uh, I keep coming back to what we have. What C Citizens United has allowed us is basically disclosure. So as much disclosure as we can get, that's what we're we're aiming for, and that's why the system now allows for better disclosure. It allows uh, before you used to literally on on campaign finance deadline day, our office would have a full full office of, uh, of reporters because they were all coming up to get different copies of different candidates. Well, if you were down in the Bennington Banner, you would not have that luxury because that's a three-hour ride for you to yeah. get up there. Now you can sit at a desktop anywhere anywhere in the world, really, and pull it up, pull up the information as it is filed. It, it, the minute you hit submit, the candidate hits submit or a PAC hits submit, it, it gets uploaded into the system and it's public. And how is this tied into the state committee that you've, or the joint committee you formed with the attorney general? Um, well, this is the, the joint committee with the, the attorney general. We're actually meeting tonight in Rutland, um, and and what we're doing there is we've we've set up meetings around the state. We we were in Bennington earlier, a uh, couple I don't know maybe a month ago, yeah. and and what we've done is is the attorney the way it's set up in the law is. I'm in charge of compliance. In other words, I'm the one that gives out the rules and all this stuff and makes sure that people are filing. The, gov the uh, attorney general is the one that has to enforce the, that law. Mm -hmm. So if, an, if someone files a complaint, um, they file it with the attorney general's office, and the attorney general's office will, will conduct an investigation and determine if there's any charges that need to be filed or if it's just nothing. Um, so. We looked at it, it was pretty, it was, we talked about compliance and enforcement, and neither one of us, we both operate, I think we both prefer to operate from the standpoint of education, mm -hmm. and we don't want to whack people. You know, we don't want to hammer over their head. We want to actually help people understand the law and really to help them to comply with the law. So what we're doing is we're actually just running around the state right now. Uh, we've, we'll, we'll have had six or seven when we're done. Uh, six or seven meetings um, where we're listening to the public, we're listening to candidates, we're listening to parties, uh, and we're tr just trying to get feedback and information. Uh, how do you want? How would you like us to, to deal with this? Um, and what can we do better? What can we do? So there are different things that have come out of it. For instance, public financing. Mm -hmm. We have a public financing law. It's only for the governor and lieutenant governor's race, and it allows a candidate. They have very stringent. Um, criteria that they have to follow. And if you're a, a lieutenant governor's candidate, you can get up to $200,000 for your for their your election. Or if you're a uh, uh, governor's candidate, you can get up to 600000 Well, you heard me say $13 million, so that doesn't go very far these days. So, um, it, you know, individual candidates, I think the individual candidates last time spent close to $2 million, raised and spent close to $2 million. And if you if you're running a public financing situation and you've got 600,000, it's kind of hard to compete against 2 million. Yeah. Absolutely. So so we know that the public financing has to be fixed. Um, and I can tell you that that um, uh, Maine and Connecticut both have public financing and they have it down into their legislative races. Uh, and roughly 80 to 85 percent of their legislative races are actually run by public financing. 
uh, they've really embraced it, and uh, it, it's it's been a boon. When you when you have public financing, you don't have to go out and spend your time fundraising. You can just spend your time dealing with the issues. That's great. And what has the response been at these meetings? Uh, the, the response has been pretty good. I mean, we've had anywhere from, I'd say, 20 to 30 people at each of the meetings, and uh, the response has been good. People, they pushed us on, on public financing. They pushed us on the limits, whether we should lower the limits um, even further. Um, so the, the, there's different aspects of it, but I think people get the impression that we're really trying to work with the public to, to how do we comply and how do we enforce. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that's come up is uh, they, they a lot of the public has said to us that there's no, there, from a standpoint of if someone doesn't file or files late, there's no penalty. So what's the incentive to, to make sure you file on time? The only thing we have right now is if the press asks us and we can say, well, so-and-so didn't file. And then the press can take do whatever they want with it. So it's kind of the shame kind of piece. But there are some, some folks have, have said, well, maybe there ought to be some kind of a penalty. You know, $50 or something if you're a week late, $50 if you're, you know, if it's a Senate race, maybe $100, whatever. But so that's something the legislature has to make a decision on, not us. Uh, and what our plan is, is, is to, at the end of these six or seven meetings, we will uh, compile a report, make some recommendations, and provide that to the legislature. And our hope is that the legislature will take it up um, and, um, and work it out for us. It sounds like it's been very constructive so far. It, it has been. It's been very good. That's always it's, good, to it's see. good It's good to get out and, and see the public. Yeah. And in the past, you've been a very vocal supporter as well of a, the formation of a state ethics committee. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I've, I've been a strong supporter of ethics uh, legislation. Uh, Vermont was one of, depending on what poll you're looking at, but one of three or four states that does not have an ethics commission. And that's not to say that there's a problem out there. I don't believe there really is a problem. But even the smallest issue could can become a problem. Yeah. And I think, you know, we've seen a lot of embezzlements in, at, at the municipal level throughout the state. Um, we've seen people charged with, you know, uh, conflict of interest. Um, you know, the, on a select board situation, you might have uh, the, the select board chair hires his brother to mow the cemetery lawns and doesn't put it out to bid, but just hires his brother to do it. Yeah. Um, and, and at the municipal level, there is no mandate for a conflict of interest. Um, and what we've been asking for is that, that there should be a mandate that every town should have a conflict of interest policy. Uh, at, the federal, at the state level, not the federal level, but at the state level, uh, we've been working with the legislature to come up with ideas and plans for uh, having a commission, a, a five-member commission that's independent. Um, I continue to insist that they need to have the resources, the proper amount of resources, and they have to have the authority to, to do their job. It can't be under another elected body. It has to be a separate standalone group. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we had was, for instance, that the, the Supreme Court Chief Justice would, would pick one person, the ACLU might pick another, somebody else. Uh, it's, in the, it's in the bill, the bill's, I think, on the governor's desk or about to be on the governor's desk. Uh, it's, a, it's a step in the right direction, but I think it still needs more. Uh, but I think that, um, uh, that, that there's a lot of good things in it. There's a, a pay to play where you can't, you can't go, I can't, for instance, if um, there were charges that the former attorney general was, was uh, accepting money contributions to his campaigns from companies that he was actually dealing with. So th there's provisions about stopping that, what's called pay to play. There's also uh, the revolve, what's called the revolving door. If um, a lobbyist, or if you, if you be, were a legislator or a state official and you left state service, and then went to become a lobbyist, uh, there, you have to have a time, like I think it's one year, you, you know, th that you're out of office before you can actually start lobbying your, your uh, colleagues, your former colleagues. Uh, so it's, it's, there are many different provisions in there, uh, but I think it's important for trusting government, for transparency in government. 
Great. And there's definitely a price tag that goes along with the formation of a new committee. How does that balance with the public benefit? Well, I don't think the price tag is that high. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, um, and I think the first thing I would say to you is, what's the price of democracy? Absolutely. And, and I think trust, and, and specifically trust in democracy. Um, the legislature put $100,000 towards this for a part-time uh, executive director, and then they gave the executive director a lot of duties. And from my standpoint, I don't see how the executive director could do everything that they're supposed to do as a part-time executive director. I think it needs to be a full-time executive director. I think there needs to be an attorney on the staff and, and possibly an investigator. So I, I've always talked about in Vermont we could start small, three people. Yeah. Um, and figuring between office space and, and um, um, office supplies, things like th that you need to purchase, as well as salaries and benefits, I was saying it should be somewhere between three and five hundred thousand uh, dollars. The legislature only went with a hundred thousand, and uh, we'll see what happens yeah. in the future. Great, and all of these issues like campaign finance reform and ethics tie into this larger discussion of government transparency and just government. Why have you decided to make this such a hallmark of your time at Secretary of State? Well, I think. As I said I, in the very beginning, I, I've served 18 years as, on the uh, South Burlington City Council, eight years in the State Senate, and now six plus years in, 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 as Secretary of State. And from the very get-go, when I first ran for Secretary of State, my whole campaign was around transparency in government, about up, open government being good government. And I, I could see, even as far back as 2010, that people were losing trust in their government. And if you look at what's happening now across the country, um, people just don't trust government officials, period. Uh, we've had that happen here in Vermont. And, and I just think that the, the one way we can do that is be more open, more transparent, uh, provide information. That's why when I first took office, uh, I pushed the legislature in 2011 to, to strengthen the public records access law. I, I pushed them again to strengthen the open meeting law, and and frankly, it was a it was a it was a good working relationship between my former colleagues that I used to be part of and and uh, my new role as Secretary of State. So we've strengthened the open meeting law. We've strengthened the Public Records Act. Um, now we've got the Ethics Commission that we're pushing, and these are all things. And 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 it's you know I, I've not only talked the talk, but I've also walked the walk, and yeah. we completely revamped our website. Our website is now, every bit of information that is within our, my hands, my, my organization, my agency, is really available on site, on, on, online. Uh, and we've made our, our website very accessible. Um, often people will tell us that, that we have the best website in state government. Uh, and it's because we started from scratch and we, we looked at it from a, from a public's point of view. How, you know, the public is always trying to interact with state government. And the other thing that I, I my entire work career um, outside of government was was about pub, uh, basically about customer service. So I have really uh, stressed with my staff, with all 75 people that work for us, uh, that we're going to provide good customer service. That we are going to answer the phone. We are going to respond to our emails. Um, I don't want to wait a week. I don't want people to wait three, four, five days to get a response. I want them. I want preferably right away, but at least within 24 hours. And if nothing else, to tell people that um, it's going to take a little more time. I need I need to do some more research. So customer service, I think, is is important. And and consequently, people will call our office for stuff we don't have anything to do with. <laughs> and we just we but we one of the things we do is we'll pull up the state directory and find somebody that they can call instead of just saying nope, that's not us and hang up the phone, we actually will look for an email address or a phone number for them so that they can make contact. That's great, and that's so refreshing to hear. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Secretary Condos. I really appreciate it. I really appreciated the opportunity. Great, thank you so much. To learn more about government transparency and campaign finance reform, keep an eye out for our newest column in the Manchester Journal. This has been Vermont Voices, viewing national news through a local lens. Thanks, and have a great night.